Ladies and gentlemen, Black History Month continues and we continue with our coverage. One of the little known and not talked enough about heroes of the civil rights movement was a young lady by the name of Claudette Colvin. Gentleman has written a fine gentleman has written a book about her and we want to tell you all about it. Uh, his name is Philip Hose. His book, Claudette Colvin, Twice Toward Justice. He joins us now. Philip, how are you, man? Very well, Mark. Thanks for inviting me. And it's a pleasure to, to have you. Um, what inspired you to write about Claudette as, as, as little as is known about her? I wrote a book uh, about young people in U.S. history. Mm -hmm. It was um, a study that took me about six years to research and, and finally get published. And uh, it's about 70 stories in chronological order of episodes in U.S. history. And when I got to the civil rights movement, I recognized it just blew me away how huge the contribution that young people made uh, was, you know, to the civil rights movement. Brown versus the Board of Education was all about schools and who went in those schools with, with kids. And, oh, you just found so many examples, Barbara Johns and, and uh, the, the Little Rock Nine and just so on. But I ran across this story as I was uh, researching of a girl, a 15-year-old girl from Montgomery, Alabama, who really did the same thing as Rosa Parks a year earlier with uh, terrible consequences. She, you know, <laughs> lost popularity in her school and kids mocked her and she was jailed and so forth. And it was really a dramatic uh, story. And I, I decided that I wanted to tell it um, more expansively than I had in the, the chapter in the book about kids in history. So it, it tell us then, Philip, um, Claudette's story and and exactly how how she did, uh, as um, a, a matter of fact, um, end up um, doing what Rosa Parks did before she did it. Well, Claudette grew up in uh, a, a little rural uh, place in in uh, just a spot in the road in in Alabama, and then when she was nine moved uh, with her family to Montgomery, and uh, this was in the in the early 50s. Mm -hmm. And she her, grew up just hearing stories uh, told by the women around her. Everybody in Montgomery who was African-American or of color, they, there were only two jobs. If you were a, a man, you were a, a yard boy. If you were a, a woman, you were a maid. They each made the same amount of money, $3 a day. Um, and Claudette just heard story after story of uh, how women were raped and, and uh, mistreated in, in, these, in these homes. And uh, she became angry. She wasn't uh, a passive person at all, and she became angry, and she would tell her, her uh, the adults in her life, why do you take it? Why do you take it? And they'd say, well, you know, you'll take it too. And she just got more and more angry. Uh, uh, a classmate of hers was uh, arrested and charged with rape, and, and this gave rise to the first political activity she ever did. She went to try to raise money for his defense with the NAACP, um, and all along she was uh, listening to her teachers, who several of whom at, at her school, Booker T. Washington Junior High, were telling him, telling her and their their classmates stories uh, about uh, African American accomplishments and uh, the the nobility and, and greatness of civilizations in in Africa, and she was becoming proud uh, to be of color. Mm -hmm. And uh, one day she had just had enough. I mean, it was spontaneous. She got on the bus with her classmates and uh, headed for home, and uh, the bus laws, the segregation bus laws were just totally humiliating. Uh, if you were of color, you could not sit in a seat that was parallel to or in front of uh, a white person. And uh, if a white person walked 
down the aisle, you were supposed to get up and give her your seat and move to the back. No, no matter whether you were, you know, carrying groceries, school books, anything, babies, anything. And uh, so that's exactly what happened. Four, uh, four girls, school girls coming home from school sat in a particular row and uh, a white woman walked, got in the board of the bus and walked down and, and stopped uh, by that row and the driver glanced up into his mirror and said I need those seats and the other three left but uh, Claudette said uh, she just couldn't do it anymore as she said uh, history kept her down uh, in the seat in the seats uh, Sojourner Truth she said pushed her down on one shoulder and Harriet Tubman pressed her on the other and all that she had been re- reading it just ripened in her and she didn't speak, she, but she didn't move. And then uh, finally two cops uh, boarded uh, and uh, told her to get off. And she said, it's my constitutional right to stay on this bus. And uh, one grabbed one armpit and one grabbed the other. And they jerked her out of her seat with her school books scattering, took her to jail, um, locked her in the back seat. One of the two officers jumped in the back seat with her and tried to you know guess her bra size and just all sorts of filthy crap um and uh, she got down to the adult um police uh, jail she was booked in uh, by adults and uh, sent to jail and uh, was denied a, a dime to call her people nobody knew where she was for a while and then uh and then they they finally found her through her her minister of of her church, and she was uh, brought home that night. And her, the story of her her ordeal and her courage uh, spread. And uh, but after a while, you know, it got kind of sour. She she insisted on fighting the charges against her, which were three three charges. One was disobeying the. Uh, segregation rules in the bus and uh, another of the the two the one that really galled her was uh, that she had um, um, beaten on her uh, beaten on the the, the police that uh, that she had assaulted the police that had uh, arrested her she insisted on the right to uh, contest these charges in court and it had never been done before but the um, black populace of um, Montgomery had been kind of looking for a way to uh, get after the bus rules which were just particularly humiliating to them and they thought maybe this case would do and so the NAACP the local branch took it on and uh, African-American churches raised money including the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, which was the new reverend in town, Dr. King's uh, church, and they got enough money to hire one of the only two lawyers, one of the only two African-American lawyers in all of Montgomery, Fred Gray. He was only 26 and just out of law school at that time. They uh, And he prepared a case and caught at lost, um, and lost again on appeal. Um, she was convicted of all the charges. She was put on uh, probation as a ward of the state in the custody of her parents. Uh, her school chums, her schoolmates mocked her. She'd walk around the corner and they'd say, it's my constitutional right. It's my constitutional right. And uh, her uh, school, her church mates, uh, the youngsters in the church, they also uh, mocked her. She she had a hair of uh, terrible time and uh her confidence tanked uh the head of the NAACP youth division in Montgomery was Rosa Parks who helped Claudette raise the money and and uh was helpful to her uh, you know in in other ways was supportive of her um uh, I think I'll stop there because I'm running out of steam, Mark. <laughs> well, when that, just a couple of follow, follow-up questions. Uh, uh, Philip Hose with his folks, Claudia Colvin, twice toward justice. She, um, how old was she when this happened? Fifteen. And she was in, in, in high school in Montgomery? Yes, she was a freshman. 
And she, you mentioned she, she was doing some work with the NAACP? No, she wasn't. Okay, uh, her her connection with the NAACP came when um, she expressed her desire to have a lawyer, and the NAACP took on a fundraising task um, to get to to pay for a lawyer for her. I see. I see. I see. Um, we, when we've heard her story in the past. Um, it was sort of a, a, a cliche attached to it that she was um, uh, um, unpalatable to the powers of being Montgomery. She didn't have the right image or pedigree as Rosa Parks did. And that is why her story was kind of, you know, swept under the rug. Address that for us, if you would, if because that's what we've always heard. Now, since that time, um, that was probably, I guess, somewhat overstated, but and it was probably more urban legend than anything. But there is some truth to the fact that her story was overshadowed by. It is a fact it was overshadowed by Rosa Parks. But but is there any truth at all? Because you're you're talking about the uh, Rosa Parks supporting her, Dr. King supporting her, so it's obviously not true that she was just some random person that people just couldn't get behind. Where did it go awry, whereby her story pretty much was forgotten and had to be resurrected? Well, it's a it's a good question. I think that uh, when she got a lawyer. And Fred Gray prepared a case and and tried it in in court. That uh, there was a lot of interest in in Claudette, and there was uh, some hope that um, that that case would uh, would perhaps change things. And one of the the early things that one of the first political acts that Dr. King ever did was he went with a, a delegation of people to City Hall to try to work out some better deal for Claudette. Um, but I think when they lost those cases, you know, and lost on appeal, that um, they moved on, and they they had sort of wrung what they could out of out of Claudette's experience. They they saw uh, something about the readiness of the black community to uh, get behind a a, a bus protest. <clears throat> they. They had all they they needed from her, and um, when ten months later, Rosa Parks, uh, you know, declined to uh, to surrender her seat to a black bus public bus uh, passenger, I think they were ready, and they didn't need Claudette anymore. And Claudette really wasn't the kind of person, in a way, to uh, stand in the center of the road and and uh, yell, "Hey, pay attention to me! Pay attention!" She um internalized things so i i think that that that's uh what it what it was i think that the the adults who ran um you know the black community the leader the adult leaders in in uh, montgomery looked at claudette and uh and saw her as uh, a very dark-skinned teenager who spoke her piece and uh didn't go to the right church, was being raised not by her parents, but by uh, her great aunt and great uncle. And they uh, and later on, she got pregnant, not when these decisions were, were taking place. But I think, you know, the, the whole thing, coupled with Claudette's uh, reticence, natural sort of reticence to, you know, toot her own horn, um, probably combined uh, to... Uh, to, to create these these this portrait that you've just you've just described, Mark. Um, and that was the other thing too, because because the the urban legend was that she was with child when she refused to give up her seat. That is what was commonly repeated. And then you know um, I, I've met uh, Claudette. I. Um, I'm on the board of the, the the Jubilee Commemoration of Bloody Sunday in Selma. 
Right. And a few years ago, she came to participate and receive an award. And she spoke and said, you know, people thought I was pregnant, but I was not. She said at the time she did get pregnant um, later on. I don't know how long after, but um, it sounds like from what you're saying is that um, in addition to um, her not maybe going to the St. Wright Church or being raised by her parents, it sounds like Rosa was something that was deliberately orchestrated and organized, whereas Claudette was a little more spontaneous and they weren't prepared for that. Is that a pretty accurate summation? I think it's partly accurate. They certainly weren't prepared for her and they had to decide, are we going to ride this, this, this horse out, you know, are we going to, uh, uh, do what we can? And they, they decided to, they decided yes. And the NAACP, um, uh, raised money as I, as I've, uh, as I've said. So I think, you know, that, that part of it's true. The part that I, I doubt is the part that, uh, that says uh, African-American adult leaders um, looked at Claudette's case and then planned something of their own because I think they got surprised, too. I, I don't happen to believe that, that Rosa Parks and uh, Fred Gray and others, Mr. Nixon and others, uh, set a date, made a plan, and, and Rosa carried it out. I don't think that happened. I think it's it's um okay. Fred Gray told Fred Gray told me that the 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 lawyer who represented Claudette and Rosa Parks that yes they talked about it a lot they had lunch together Parks and Gray uh a lot and uh, talked about what could be done in the city and it's also true that uh Rosa Parks went to the Highlander school for a couple of weeks not long before she took her stand and her her life was transformed by seeing what what human relationships could be um but i don't think that uh, that they planned it uh to a date i see i see um philip hose with us folks claudette colvin twice toward justice um uh, the, the title twice toward justice what do you mean by twice well i think that claudette risked her life twice um when she um uh, you know, when you do something conspicuous like like sue, like defend yourself um, from from these charges, uh, it, it's conspicuous. It's in the paper. Her right. picture was in the paper, right. and uh, the Klan was was big in in uh, in Montgomery, and race hatred was bitter and burning in in there, and and so she not only risked her own life, but in a way risked the lives of her neighbors or her uh, family, for sure. I mean, they the night uh, that Claudette was arrested and, and then freed, there were uh, people who sat up with guns all night expecting the, the Klan to climb the hill that they lived on, King King's Hill. So that was uh, the first time that she risked her own life for, for justice. You know, she wanted to... Um, confront contend challenge the the uh the ruling against her and uh the other thing though was uh later during the montgomery bus boycott days that the that boycott got off to a to a flying start it was a, a work of genius i mean you didn't just have to stand up and yell and go to go to church and sing and so forth, uh, you had to organize an alternative transportation system which would move hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids to school and hundreds and hundreds of workers to their to their workplaces. And I think that after a while, um, it became pretty evident, to some people at least, that it wasn't going to work. Uh, it wasn't going to work entirely, at least. And... Uh, uh, it meant too much to the South as the Southern way of life for the bus company to give in, for the, the, the leadership of Montgomery to give in, and that they needed something to supplement the the bus boycott. And uh, Fred Gray had the idea that probably since there was a federal court in Montgomery that they would try to take on the, the very uh, rules, the bus rules, 
that uh, segregated racially the the, the buses in uh, Alabama and in Montgomery. And so uh, he went to New York and uh, spoke with Thurgood Marshall and other people and got strategic advice, came back and uh, pitched his case, and the leadership of the uh, the bus boycott went with him, said, okay, do it. And then the first thing he had to do, Fred, had to find plaintiffs, that is, people who would represent their position publicly, that would put their name on a lawsuit. And uh, that was incredibly dangerous because it was even more conspicuous. By now, there's a, a real fevered pitch to, uh, to to the conflict, and it's been going on for months and months. And uh, Fred couldn't find anyone, and he went back to Claudette, a proven warrior, someone who'd already done it before and, and said, uh, you know, will you do this? Will you let me put your name on this lawsuit? Will you testify in court? Mm -hmm. uh, and he, and she was, I think, seven months pregnant at this time. And she, you know, pointed to her belly and said, yeah, this is going to go over really big. And um, Fred said, by the time you testify, you will have had your baby. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was... Uh, and she she prayed, you know, she prayed, she talked to the people that she respected the most, and she said, okay, I'll do it once more. And she allowed her name to, to go on that lawsuit as a plaintiff. And there was another 19-year-old girl um, whose last name was Smith, Mary Smith, and uh, two uh, adults who put their name, all women, who put their names on that uh, lawsuit, and and then they went on uh, May May eleventh, I believe it was, nineteen fifty six. They testified in a case that was called Browder versus Gale, which challenged the segregation, racial segregation on public transportation. And uh, Claudette, in my book, Claudette called him twice twice toward justice. I uh, was able to find chunks of Claudette's testimony and testimony by the other women so you can see you know what happened in that lawsuit which basically had the same effect with transportation as did uh brown versus the board of education with schools and that was the lawsuit that was won that ultimately ended the boycott correct yeah um it, it did when it, it dragged on a little bit longer the city contested it uh but uh, in, it, I think it was at the end of 1956, the, the ruling came down. It was appealed. Um, there, were, there were three judges, and uh, miraculously, two of them uh, went with the plaintiffs. Frank Johnson, a, a famous uh, Alabama judge, in, in, one, in his first significant case, uh, uh, defended the, the position of the plaintiffs. And yeah, it was um, in the winter, I think it was in December, Mark, right. of uh, 1956 that uh, that happened. That It went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the, the Supreme Court sent it back down without comment. And it shocked, absolutely stunned people, <laughs> but they did it. Yeah, yeah. Um the um uh, so that 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 is twice that she that she yeah stuck her neck out and and we're thankful for that um do you think that uh, now after your book's been written and and as other people have shown an interest in her story she's getting the um recognition she deserves or do we still have a ways to go we still have a ways to go. I think one place where the gap may be narrowing just a little bit is with kids, with 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 young people, uh, immodestly, because um, the book that I wrote was was marketed extensively to, to young readers, and it, and it did well. It, it got major awards and and sold and continues to sell well. And so I think there are, are more sort of percentage more um, young people who know her story and respond to her story than 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 older people. Yeah, yeah. Well, as old folks need to get ourselves together. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I confess to you, Philip, you know, and, and this is purely procrastination on my part. Um, Claudette lives here in New York, 
and I've been meaning uh, to reach out to her to actually have her join us in the studio one of these days and join us on the show. Um, and I hope to do that. You know, you, you've you kind of um, inspired me to get myself together and, and make that happen because uh, we, we need to hear from her. And uh, we, I met her in Selma, very, very sweet woman. Um, oh, she's wonderful. Yeah, she is. She's a wonderful person. And so um, hopefully um, we'll be able to do that. But, I, you know, I said, you know, let me let me talk. Go ahead and talk to Philip now and talk to him first so we can all be educated. So, folks, when she joins us, we will Philip will have given us her story and we can ask her even more intelligent questions about what she did, what it was like, what she went through where courage came from, how she made some of the decisions that she made. So we will look forward to that. In the meantime, uh, I hope you all have been enlightened hearing this story about Claudette Colvin. Um, I hope that you will read the book and especially share with him. You know, it's funny, Philip, your book and others essentially being marketed to, to young adults. Um, when it comes to black history, all of us are adolescents. So to me, there's yeah. no such thing. I mean, we're all young adults and children. So, you know, if a book has a certain age range on it, it's still relevant to adults because there's so little written about us and so little that we know about our history. So the, the regular rules um, and age categories, as far as I'm concerned, do not apply. <laughs> okay. I think it's a good point. Yeah, yeah. And um, we still have um, a lot uh, to do and a lot to learn, and it's it's about time. God bless you for writing this, and, and thank you for taking on her story. We'll, we'll spread this word. And um, um, like I said, hopefully we'll get, we'll get Claudette in here with us and, and so our audience can see and hear her as well. But Philip, I want to thank you for joining us. Okay, buddy. Mark, it's been my pleasure. Thanks so much for inviting me. By the way, you working on anything else right now or? I, I'm uh, between books at the moment. Okay. Okay. What well, is, are you going to do anything else uh, from a history perspective or, or what? Abs absolutely. Okay. I just, I just finished a book and it, it's, uh, it's been out uh, a year about uh, young people in Denmark who, uh, objected to the German occupation of their city and formed a, a sabotage cell and caused all sorts of problems for the, the Germans. Is that right? And, yeah, it's That's called. Great. Yeah, it's um, it's called uh, the Churchill Club. Ah, and, okay. Uh, that's, that's what that's what they they named themselves. Actually, the 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 main title is the Boys Who Challenged Hitler. I love it. I love it. Well, we'll look. We'll look forward to that, and 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 let us know when you get that done too. We'll talk about it. How about that? Okay, that that'd be great. All right, Philip Hose, our very special guest, Claudette Colvin, twice toward justice. And um, Philip, enjoy the rest of your Black History Month. Okay, buddy. Okay, you too, Mark. Thank all, you. All right. Take care now. Bye bye. Bye bye.